Hello friends, welcome back to another edition of Us as American Flyer where we continue today to take a look at the transition from true scale, 316th O scale to S. And uh, today we're going to start our focus on some engines. Um, as you'll see here in this catalog, Flyer was making a lot of different types of engines for O gauge track, um, but they selected a very specific few of them to convert to this true scale idea. And to kind of jumpstart us today, before we look at specific engines and some of their similarities and differences, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that were happening in O scale that then couldn't happen in S scale. Um, first of all, I'm gonna borrow my single Lionel engine that I have to talk about the motors themselves. Um, you may or may not know that uh, Flyer and many others uh, use something called a spur drive. In other words, the armature uh, was situated so that it was, uh, it was parallel with the rails and there was a spur gear that came off to the side that drove the wheels and it allowed uh, the wheels to turn without being powered, uh, which some of the early true scale American Flyer engines retained this kind of drive. But you'll notice here in the literature that they also begin to talk about a different kind of drive. A different kind of drive that they even included warnings about don't try to push your engine or turn the wheels without power because it was so different. And that was this kind of a deal. You had an armature with a screw drive on the end and this fit inside a chassis on the end here's your field, and it would go through the chassis into a gear on the rear set of drivers. And then the linkages on the side would transfer that motion to drivers, however many there were on the engine. This was a totally different way of powering trains. And um, as you can see here in the literature, uh, they actually employed this in, in war fighters, uh, airplanes. So it's, it's kind of interesting uh, where the technology came from. Um, but they had some remarkable claims about power and about uh, steady operation that you got with this kind of a drive. Uh, I'm not an expert there, so I'll leave that for those that are smarter than me to debate. But something else that's uh, kind of important that also happened with three rail, as you might know, you have three rails. The outside two rails are the same polarity. So for argument's sake, let's say they're the plus. The inside rail is the negative. So when you had a three rail engine, you could have metal wheels, a metal axle, and not worry about shorting because the polarity was the same on the drivers. Then the reverse polarity or opposite polarity was picked up in the center by rollers or wipers. And that was super handy in some ways because for example, if you have a reverse switch or a loop of track that comes back on itself, there was no circuitry issue. There was no short issue. You just ran the train and it came back at you and it never never missed a, a beat. And, <clears throat> and there's some you know simplicities gained when your wheels are all metal. You just don't have to worry about it. Fast forward to two rail. Now we have a problem because now we have one rail that's gonna be positive and one rail that's gonna be negative. We can no longer use metal tread on both sets of drivers with metal axle because you'll get a short. So Flyer's solution was our very well-known plastic insulator or three-piece steam engine wheel. Um, the diesel wheels uh, had an insulator around the center. Um, but that's just another engineering thing that they had to think through and figure out, okay, how are we gonna make this work? Because we can't use all metal wheels anymore. Same was true with cars, freight cars. Uh, I've heard it said that Lionel trains, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd be going rolling behind an engine and then the sound would be deafening from the metal on metal, the metal wheels on metal rails. And uh, Flyer had to come up with a different solution for two rail. And their solution, of course, was plastic wheels. This next piece is probably the most complicated piece of technology that American Flyer worked on for their new true scale steam engines. I've been doing some research but to be honest I don't know if I've got my head wrapped around it 
So those of you that know for sure how these things work may need to correct me, but I'm going to take a stab at it. So there apparently were some different options for reverse units on these new steam engines. One was the traditional drum with solenoid that we're familiar with with a lockout lever. There was another type called an RDC and this reverse unit was triggered by a DC current that was sent through the track and this had a plate in it that a person could push down when the engine was uh, on the rails and manually change direction or you could press a button and the current, the small DC current, would flip it during the engine's operation. You will notice here a picture of a K5 shell with no locking lever slit in the top of the boiler shell. So that means this would have only had the RDC reverse unit in it. In some conversations I've had with some people, particularly the gentleman by the name of John Edwards, he said that he believed this RDC was Flyer's attempt to mimic what Lionel was doing at the time. In 1939, American Flyer released their true scale J3A Hudson. The number was 5405 and it was available in either kit form or ready to run form. It had both spur drive and rear mounted worm drive motor options and it was the first to have a lockout lever protruding through the boiler shell. It also had the RDC reverse option. Sometime in late 39 to early 40, the spur drive was discontinued. Also, the numbers changed and it became a number 570 that either had their lever reverse or RDC in the boiler or a number 531 which only had the RDC in the boiler. By 1941, the armature shaft size was increased and this size of the new armature was then carried over into S production. In 1946, the post-war S gauge Hudson switched to S gauge and the number 320 had no smoke or choo-choo or the number 321 had just the chuff and the number 322 had the smoke and tender. Also in 1939, the True Scale Northern was released by the American Flyer Company and it initially carried the number 806. It was available in kit or ready to run options. It included only the spur drive, but you could get either the RDC reverse system or the locking lever. Uh, reverse unit in the boiler. Later in 39 or early 40 the motor uh, became a worm drive and was moved to the rear. The spur drive was discontinued. The number was changed to 570 or 533. The 570 had the lever type locking reverse unit or RDC where the 533 only had the RDC. As formally stated with the J3A in 41, the armature was updated. The number was changed to a 572. And then in 1946, the number was again changed to number 332, and the scale changed to S. And if you're interested, please check out this link for some additional operations of an early northern. As always, thank you so much for sticking around with me today. I hope you found this interesting. As always, I appreciate your feedback. And until next time, take care. God bless. Enjoy those O-scale or S-scale American Flyer trains. We'll see you. Take care. Bye-bye.